Welcome, welcome. It's nice to see everyone this Friday afternoon. Um, if I don't say it again, happy holidays. And if I don't see you, happy new year, happy healthy new year to everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. This is going to be a great one. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jamie Seward. I'm Associate Director of Lifelong Learning Programs with the Office of Alumni Relations. I'm here with our special guest, Sam Besson, the Eleanor and Lester Levy Family Curator of Sheet Music and Popular Culture at the Sheridan Libraries at Johns Hopkins University. Now, before I turn the program over to Jim Williams, the president of the Friends of the Libraries, I'd like to thank today's program co-sponsors, the Sheridan Libraries and University Museums, the Friends of Johns Hopkins University Libraries, and the Arts, Entertainment, Media, and Entrepreneurship Affinity. I encourage you to ask questions during the program by typing them in the Zoom Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We will have time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Mr. Jim Williams. Thank you, Jamie. I am delighted to um, welcome you all to the 11th in the Lunch with the Library series. Since the Friends began to co-sponsor this series last fall, over 1,800 viewers from all across the country have tuned in and enjoyed learning about the fascinating activities of the Hopkins Libraries, and to meet some of the extremely talented curators and staff who make these informative presentations. I am also pleased to welcome those viewers who are now joining us through the Hopkins Odyssey program. These Friday lunchtime programs highlight some of the unique ways that supporting Johns Hopkins libraries impacts our students, faculty, and the community at large. If you would like to consider help joining us in our mission, please become a member of the Friends of the Libraries by making a gift at library.jhu.edu. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Sam Beeson is the Eleanor and Lester Levy Family Curator of Sheet Music and Popular Culture. Many of you may remember Sam from his excellent virtual lecture last February entitled Lunch, I'm sorry, entitled Love at the Libraries, in emphasizing the love for collecting. Since starting as the curator of the Lester Levy Collection in January of 2020, Sam has adapted adopted to the unprecedented limitations imposed by the pandemic to become a passionate ambassador for the collection. He has presented numerous online educational programs and exhibits, facilitated research, completed major upgrades to the collection website, and found new ways to promote the collections via social media and the library's log, blog. Prior to his work with the Levy Collection, Sam founded the In the Stack series at the George Peabody Library, where he brought new life to the university's special collections by pairing them with music, art, drama, and film. Sam has a bachelor's degree from the University of Denver and a master's in music from the Peabody Conservatory at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for joining us today, Sam. We look forward to learning more about Tin Pan Alley. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. As Jim said, I'm Sam. I'm the curator of uh, sheet music and popular culture here. Uh, my background is in music performance, particularly in French horn. Uh, I was a French horn player for many years. Uh, and today, I thought I would share with you a, a recent project that I uh, finished um, that uses data from our sheet music collections. Uh, I hedge when I say finished because uh, I think this will be a project that will be in the works for quite a while. Uh, so I kind of consider the version that I'm showing to you today is kind of version one of, of hopefully many. Uh, but this project centers around Tin Pan Alley, uh, which as we'll see is both a place in New York City, uh, specifically 28th Street in Manhattan between I think 6th and Broadway. Uh, but it was also uh, a movement and a migration uh, in the entertainment industry and just this period of, of hyper-productivity uh, in the sheet music industry in particular. 
Uh, so to give you just a little bit more context behind Tin Pan Alley, I thought I would bring us back to New York City uh, in 1880, which is when the scope of this project starts. Uh, so musically, what's going on, um, the piano is really the center of home entertainment. Um, so sheet music was really the lucrative industry. Um, you know, radio, phonograph, record players, cinema, these were not yet widely available. Um, as far as live entertainment, uh, blackface minstrelsy is, is still really in full swing here, um, although it's kind of giving way to vaudeville around the turn of the century. Um, it's also important to remember that theaters at this time were still segregated, uh, and they were actually separate booking agencies for white performers and for black performers. Uh, now in 1880, uh, when this project starts, uh, the center of uh, kind of music publishing activity was in Union Square in New York City, uh, which was between 14th and 18th streets downtown. And over the scope of this project, over the next 60 years, up until 1940, uh, the industry just saw this huge boom of productivity, uh, but also a migration up New York. And that's, that's why I kind of started this project, was to help kind of visualize this, uh, this period of productivity and this migration. Um, as we'll see, the industry kind of disappeared around its peak just after the First World War, um, mostly because of the advent and the, the popularization of radio, cinema, record players, things that kind of replaced the piano uh, in the home, but also things like the Great Depression, which you know affected the entire economy. Um, something I'll point out about this period too is that sheet music tended to be a, a quantity versus quality operation. Um, these composers and these publishers were really just churning out music, trying to follow all of the latest uh, trends, uh, presidents, elections, celebrities, inventions, things like that. Um, you know, a lot of these publishers would either, you know, hire a composer and keep them on retainer just to like churn out songs all day, or they might uh, just purchase a song from a composer. But either way, all of these publishers had these little armies of what they called song pluggers that would kind of invade the city um, most of them were very young, and they would be singing these songs, you know, at restaurants and bars and theaters and street corners and, you know, sneaking backstage at vaudeville shows to try to convince the singer to, you know, sing their publisher's latest hit. Uh, so when I was studying this history, you know, there's a lot of research that's been done on Tin Pan Alley. Um, you know, I just kept finding sources that would have images of these maps. Um, you know, one article in particular, I think, was called The Case for an Alternate Tin Pan Alley. Um, and I just kept seeing all these uh, maps in the article, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be useful if this was an interactive map? Um, and so I thought, why don't I just make an interactive map? Uh, you know, I have uh, access to so much data. Um, you know, our main collection here is, of course, the Lester Levy Sheet Music Collection. Uh, it's about 30,000 songs, um, many, many of which were published in New York during this time period. So, you know, knowing that I have uh, this access uh, to the data and also access to great resources and colleagues that could help me with this project. Um, so the results, which I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. Please let me know if you can't. Um, so the result is this interactive map here. Uh, this took about eight months to build, um, and it's part of an online exhibit that I created that has a lot of background information on Tin Pan Alley. It's got all the sources that I used, uh, you know, detailed instructions on using the map, uh, and also a call to uh, customize and contribute to the map for yourself. So um, I know there's a lot going on here, so I'll sort of break all of this down um, so that you can kind of see what's going on. Uh, so first I'll kind of take you through the process for building the map. Um, I'll is illustrate a couple of ways that this uh, tool, as I like to think of it, can be used. Um, and then I'll share just a couple of insights that, that this map showed me. So that's sort of the menu for today. Um, so with the data, there were three uh, types of data that I wanted to track with this map. The first obviously being sheet music publishers, um, the second being performing arts venues, and the third uh, transportation networks, subways in particular. So with the publishers, I of course used the Levy collection. Uh, it's 30,000 songs like I mentioned. Uh, believe it or not, we actually have an Excel spreadsheet of the entire collection uh, with all of the data. So that was really uh, fun and interesting to look through. Um, 
and I sort of whittled that down to the final list of songs, uh, which ended up being about 6,000 songs by, um, you know, eliminating any songs that were published outside the island of Manhattan. Um, I actually found a couple of publishers in Brooklyn, but I decided uh, not to include them in this version of the map. Uh, I also eliminated any songs that were published before 1880 or after 1940, as that's the scope of this project. Um, and then, of course, had to get rid of any songs that were either undated or actually some didn't have a publisher listed at all, which I was a little surprised to find. Uh, I then kind of went through and standardized all of the metadata, um, made it cleaner, um, made it, you know, more consistent, assigned, you know, publisher IDs to each uh, publisher just so that I could track all of this information better. I, uh, I decided to also break up publishers into two different categories, uh, one being smaller publishers, the other larger publishers, mostly because there's such a huge gap in productivity between them. You know, a lot of the smaller publishers you'll see might have had, you know, one to five songs per year, whereas the larger publishers could have had 30 to 50 songs per year. Uh, and I wanted researchers to be able to better differentiate between the two of those. Um, I also added venues, so I chose uh, venues that were in operation between 1880 and 1940, a lot of which are still active today. Um, and for now, I only included venues that were built specifically for public performance, rather than maybe uh, you know a restaurant that had a stage, for example. Um, now, since venues at this time were segregated, I thought that it would be uh, important to represent that in the map, so I chose different icons for the white-owned or the black-owned venues. Um, there's actually a really great book that I use to help make that distinction. Uh, it's called Black Broadway. It's by Stuart Lane. Uh, and then finally, I added transportation networks. So uh, in this case, I added two of them. There's the Manhattan Elevated Railway, um, and then there's the modern subway system. Uh, this was a very challenging project. Uh, you know, first off, I had to learn how to use ArcGIS Pro, which is a, a very complicated uh, and very powerful mapping software. But uh, I had a lot of help from our GIS team, which I'm very grateful for, especially Lena Denis. Um, it was also very difficult to track down the addresses for a lot of these publishers, because a lot of them just didn't print the address on the sheet music. You might see, you know, a copyright date and the name of the publisher, but no address. Uh, and since this project is about a migration, it was really important to know where each of these publishers were. Uh, so I did a lot of digging through newspapers, newspaper advertisements, city directories, uh, trade magazines, uh, things like that to, to try to find all of these addresses. Uh, so the result is this map that you see here um, that I'll kind of walk you through. Um, I'll go ahead and remove all of the data here so that we can sort of build it back up uh, piece by piece. So I'm going to start at our most basic. Um, all of these little red icons you see here are the small publishers. Uh, most of these published less than 15 songs per year. Uh, and again, this is just data from the Levy collection. Um, you'll notice that most of them are kind of clustered along the street here. This is Broadway, but there's also quite a few outliers. We have people all the way out here. Uh, you can also click on any of these, and you'll see the name of the publisher, the uh, year for this data point, number of songs published that year, and then the address. Um, I'll also point out that the size of each icon is directly proportional to uh, the number of songs they published that year, uh, which took quite a while to figure out how to program that in ArcGIS, but I'm very glad I figured it out. Uh, so, for example, you can see this, this larger larger one here, this was 19 songs published in 1927. So the next layer of data that I'll add are the larger publishers. You can see them there. Uh, I chose to use the same shape icon, but just a different color here. Uh, so you can see them in gray. Um, and you can see if I zoom in, I mean, the, the scope of the output is just so much larger here. You know, these might be putting out multiple Broadway shows or multiple film scores each year, for example. Uh, I'll also add the venues here, so let's take away our publishers. So uh, these are the venues. I chose to represent them with these little pins, and then if I zoom out you'll see in Harlem as well, uh, with the purple color I chose to represent the, the black owned venues here. Uh, just like the sheet music you can see uh, everything is kind of centered along Broadway here, but there's definitely quite a few outliers. 
Uh, now I'll go ahead and add our transportation networks. So I did these in a couple of different steps. So um, first will be the Manhattan Elevated Railway, uh, which you can see the four lines here represented in purple. Uh, and the stops are represented by these white dots. And again, you can click on any of these and it will tell you uh, the cross street and the year that that stop opened. Uh, you can also click on the line and it will show you the entire line. <clears throat> Uh, next major thing to come along would be the subway, which was opened in 1904, that I chose uh, kind of this green line to represent, and the stations are represented by these black dots here. Uh, there were also a couple of, well not a couple, many extensions that were done to the subway that kind of created our modern subway system that I created a separate layer for. And again, you can click on any of these and, and see when they opened. Uh, the last thing I decided to include was just for any New Yorkers who might want to see the modern subway in all of its color-coded glory. Uh, this is not done to time scale. This was actually a layer that I decided to embed uh, from an existing ArcGIS project. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. So I'll go ahead and add all of our data back in. And I'll show you just a couple of the, um, the tools that I added here. Uh, for people to use this data. <clears throat> so you saw me kind of interacting with the layer list here. This is where you can choose what data you'd like to see. I also added a couple of bookmarks. These are just uh, locations that were important to the industry that kind of illustrate this migration. Uh, so this is just an overview of Manhattan. Uh, the main first location was Union Square. Uh, and this was kind of the hub of the sheet music industry around 1880. You can see a lot of publishers over here, and then this little cluster um, of venues along 14th Street. <clears throat> the next major place that everyone migrated to was Tin Pan Alley. Um, so this is 28th Street, and you can see that pretty much every building here is occupied by a sheet music publisher. Um, uh, apparently, the publishers would use the fire escapes to, to run around and communicate with each other. This was just a a street that was full of music and all of this sort of friendly competition, it seems. Um, and, you know, Tin Pan Alley, the name reportedly comes from, it's just a rumor of composer Monroe Rosenfeld uh, walking down the street and just hearing this cacophony of sounds, you know, tinny upright pianos coming through any, every window, song pluggers on the street that are yelling out the, the you know, latest hits, that he remarked that this street sounds like a Tin Pan Alley. And, and that's kind of how the, the place got its name. <clears throat> The next major location is, of course, Times Square, where the industry kind of really remains today. Uh, you can see there's so much happening here. Uh, and a lot of these venues are still in use today. Now, when you click on the venues, I also tried to include uh, any previous venue names so that you can kind of track things down that way. You can also see the year that each one opened and closed. Uh, we also have a bookmark for Harlem here. You can see there wasn't a ton of publishing activity happening here, at least according to the Levy collection. Um, you know, Harlem was much more venue based. These venues were really the ones affiliated with the Harlem Renaissance. Um, you know, you have the, uh, I think it was the Savoy Ballroom, which I think is up here somewhere. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. Odeon Theater. Uh, but the Savoy Ballroom was, um, I think it housed something like 4,000 people uh, for dancing, and there were bandstands at either side um, so that one band could be playing, and if they needed to take a break, another band could start on the other side of the, the room so that there wasn't a single second uh, of dancing that stopped. <clears throat> so in addition to those bookmarks, um, these two tools here, I won't go too far into just for time's sake, um, but these allow you to filter and export data from the map. So for example, if you wanted to write an expression that filtered out um, all of the publishers except for Whitmark and Sons, that's something that you could do, and then you could easily export that data to a spreadsheet. <clears throat> uh, but probably the most important uh, thing here is this, which is the time slider, because uh, this whole the whole point of this project was to illustrate movement over time. So I turn that on, you can now see um, the years listed down here. We're looking at 1880 to 1881. And you can kind of use these to look at any, you know, 
section of, of time that you'd like, uh, including just a single year. So um, now that I've kind of introduced the map, I'll just show you a couple of uh, insights that I found from this map. Um, the first is, is really just using this time slider, you can really see this migration happen from Union Square to Tin Pan Alley to Times Square. So if I go back to just in 1880, and I'll zoom in a little bit here, and I'll go ahead and click forward in time, and you'll be able to see that uh, these publishers and venues will kind of start crawling north along Broadway. All right, there's 1904, the first subway just went in. You can see more subways appearing. All right, now we've hit 1930, you're gonna see things start to slow down. And finally, we've kind of hit the end of the extent of the map where you can see there's really not a ton left happening. Uh, now I also, I'll go ahead and show that to you again, but this time with a five-year span, just because I've found that it, it illustrates a little bit better uh, without having some publishers appear and disappear. We had, for example, a gap in a publisher's output for a particular year. So here we're looking at 1880 to 1885, and I'll go ahead and click forward again, moving a little faster. All right, so there's just a little example of, of how this map can already start visualizing this movement. Um, the next thing I noticed were um, a lot of outliers. Um, the article that I mentioned earlier, the case for an alternate Tin Pan Alley, uh, the whole point of the article is that this movement was not so hyper-focused on 28th Street as you can see here, um, but that there was so much happening uh, outside of this kind of Broadway, uh, Broadway section. So you can see we have a publisher way up here on 75th Street, Presto Publishing, there's Music Publishers Holding Association, um, we've also got outliers way down here. Who's this friend here? Frank P. Anderson in 1883. <clears throat> so there's really a lot that's happening uh, outside of these main kind of centers of publishing activity. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have memoirs from a lot of these publishers. We don't always, you know, have in their words why they chose to move. Um, we do, though, have the autobiography of Isidore Whitmark. Uh, from Whitmark Publishing, which was really one of the largest publishers in the city. Uh, and I think they moved nine or ten times during the period of this map. Um, and they list a reason for each time. Sometimes it's, you know, a lease runs out or um, trying to find a larger building. Um, you know, scaling up definitely happened quite a bit. Um, but also some of it was, you know, trying to follow the trends as more is moving uptown. They want to be a part of that. So. Uh, there's just kind of this like rush to continually follow each other moving up north. Another question I had uh, as I was building this map was kind of the extent to which um, the subway uh, was kind of influencing different sections of the map. Um, you know, how new forms of transportation were motivating new publishing activity. So I kind of found that in some locations that the subway seemed to come after the industry had already moved north, but uh, in other locations the subway really seemed to be a motivating factor. So, for example, if we look at Union Square, you'll see we have two subway stops here, uh, but if I go ahead and turn on our time slider, we're looking at 1880 to 1881, um, as I move forward, you'll see a lot of publishing activity happen over here, and then you'll see it kind of die down. Uh, the subway will come in, but not much really happens after the subway comes in here. All right, here's the first subway line. Second subway line. Third subway line. But still, uh, at least according to the Levy collection, um, 
really no publishing activity that's happening, even after the subway comes through here. <clears throat> uh, however, if we move up to Times Square, I'll go ahead and turn on our time slider again. You'll see there's a couple of venues already there. More is definitely starting to happen. Subway goes in in 1904. And you can see things are really starting to take off. I also noticed that um, there were quite a few uh, venues in particular that uh, seem to be created just immediately next to a subway stop. So especially on this um, kind of this Broadway line going up north, uh, here's one. Here's a stop, uh, Lincoln Square Theater, Broadway and 66th, opened in 1906, uh, whereas this station opened in 1904. <clears throat> Let's see if I move up Broadway. Here's another one at 96th Street. The subway stop also opened in 1904. Um, dates unconfirmed here, but around 1911. And I think there was one more I noticed. Yeah, here it is. Subway stop opened in 1904. And let's see the venue, the Nemo Theater, 1911 or earlier. It was very difficult to track down some of the precise opening years for these venues. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. I also found um, that kind of looking at the last 10 years of the scope of this map, um, that the Great Depression really seemed to wipe out a lot of the smaller publishers and that only the larger ones were really able to survive, but they seem to be really thriving during this period even. So I'll go ahead and turn on our time slider again and we're looking at Times Square. So let's look at 1880 to 1930 where there's definitely a lot going on. And then I'll go ahead and change this to be 1930 to 1940. You can see so much less happening with the publishers here. Still, the venues are still there, of course. Uh, and then if I actually look at the year 1940, you can see, I'm not sure anywhere on the map, if there's a single small publisher that we have publishing a song. It's really just these larger publishers, uh, a lot of which were located at Rockefeller Center. So this one is Irving Berlin Inc., Chappelle & Co., uh, and you can see Radio City Music Hall. Let's see who's here. Irving Berlin Inc., another large publisher. Harms Incorporated was a huge one. Um, you notice I saw Irving Berlin in a couple places. Something I noticed on the sheet music was uh, it, there were some of the larger publishers that seemed to be publishing from different addresses simultaneously. Uh, although it may be the case that you know one might have been the address for an administrative office versus the actual you know physical building where the sheet music was printed from. <clears throat> Uh, so those are just a couple of the uh, kind of interesting insights and things that I found with this tool. Um, you know, my hope is that um, researchers or people that are interested in this time period will be able to use this tool in ways that are, of course, helpful to them. Uh, but as far as what comes next, uh, I think there's really a lot more data that could be added here that would give even more context. Uh, of course, it would be great to add in even more songs. Uh, and there are a couple of different places that I might be able to look for those, such as you know, Library of Congress or uh, the UCLA Sheet Music Consortium. Uh, I think it would be really great to add uh, even more transportation networks here, like uh, buses and trolleys, for example. Um, I think it would be great to add, you know, uh, piano showrooms, piano warehouses, uh, phonograph dealers, um, you know, the article about uh, an alternate Tin Pan Alley actually maps the uh, booking agent addresses as well. Um, we could also go through and add speakeasies during Prohibition, of course. We could add dance halls, clubs, schools. Uh, department stores would be another, another big one, knowing that, you know, Macy's moving uptown was a big impetus for a lot of um, commercial activity up there. Uh, and so on this exhibit, we have this contributing customized tab uh, where people can contact us if they have data that they'd like to contribute to this map. Uh, so that's something that I'm really excited to kind of get started working through. Uh, and of course, people can also download the map itself. Um, and I also provided access to all of the data so that researchers can look at the raw data themselves if they'd like to. 
so I think that was all that I had. Um, I will go ahead and pause there and see if there are any questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. You actually do have questions and it's wonderful. not surprising because it was such an interesting and engaging uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, exceptional work, great analysis, do more. That is the comment. <laughs> um, Thanks so much. Thank you. So we have a question. Uh, what led to the uptown migration from Union Square to Tin Pan Alley to Times Square? Sure. Um, so a lot of that had to do with um, just generally populations moving north in New York City. Um, I know that before Times Square was named Times Square, it was Longacre Square. It was kind of a seedier part of town. And I think even Times Square remained a seedier part of town well into the 90s. Um, but when the New York Times moved there in 1904, that's when it was renamed Times Square. It's also the same year that the subway opened. Um, I was reading one source that talked about how uh, real estate was very cheap on 28th Street when the publishers moved there. Uh, so it really seems like these publishers wanted to be where the action was happening. And so when they noticed that, you know, populations tended to be going to more venues that were uptown, they wanted to be there so that, you know, people could see sheet music in their windows. And so uh, they could invite vaudeville stars in to sing some of their latest hits. Um, like I mentioned too, something I would like to look more into is, is the effect that department stores had on this because it seems like uh, when Macy's moved up north uh, that it, you know, it of course took up a whole city block, but it just opened up all of this commercial uh, availability that was just kind of drawing people up north. Do you know why Macy's moved north? Uh, you may have mentioned it or do you know no, other I, companies? I, no, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Um, can you tell merger activity, like if a larger publisher bought up a smaller publisher or bought up the songbook? Hmm. You... Um, that's a really interesting point. So um, something that actually was a little bit difficult uh, with the data, especially some of the earlier data from like the 1880s, is that if, if one of the smaller publishers folded, they would actually sell their plates to another publisher who could then reuse those plates and print their music, sometimes without altering the copyright date. Uh, but there definitely were cases where these publishers uh, did kind of get purchased. Um, I think one example is the Music Publishers Holding Association, which happened, I think, in the 30s, uh, or at least 1925, that started acquiring. Um, I think Harms Incorporated ended up being purchased by Warner Brothers, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a lot of the publishers that were able to survive seemed to kind of pivot uh, from popular songs to uh, film songs. Uh, and so a lot of the copyrights and ownership kind of got swept, uh, kind of swept up with these film producers too. And that sort of rolls into one of our que uh, questions. Did the emergence of talkies also move composers and talent to California? and erode the need for sheet music publishers. Yeah, I think, you know, of course, there was definitely uh, that influx to California. Um, having looked through most of the metadata for this collection, we have very few songs that were published in California. Uh, so it seems like by the time the industry moved out there that sheet music was no longer, you know, really a popular, as popular of a medium. Interesting. Um, can individual collectors contribute to this project? Uh, yes, absolutely. If you have a collection uh, and if you have the data, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I know I can um, drop my email in the chat or I'm sure uh, it'll be shared with you. Um, we also have a contact form on the site. Um, something that I plan to do whenever we add data, uh, especially song data, is I'll have to go through and make sure there are no duplicates. Uh, just to make sure that, you know, you know, that we're not capturing those in the data. But um, absolutely, if you have a sheet music collection and want to contribute, please do get in touch. So um, it, there's a question, where will the map be available? But it looks like it's, you have the URL. Uh, yes, so this map is available. Um, you can get to it by uh, the Levy website. Uh, there's a tab, uh, let's see, using the collection online exhibits is where you'll find this. Um, but we can also share it out, I think, after the lecture via an email blast. That would be great. Yeah, if you just share it with me, I'll pass it on to everyone in attendance. And um, those who were unable to attend, 
we will get everything to you um, via email and you'll also get a recording of the program. So I have another question, which is great. Obviously, we know this is very engaging when we have a lot of questions. Is there an ethnic overlay? Was there a strong correlation between publishers and producers of the music? Hmm. Sorry, you were coming um, in and out there. Could you say that question one more time? Sure. Is there an ethnic overlay? That was one question. And then was there a strong correlation between publishers and producers of the music? So I'm not quite sure um, what you mean by ethnic overlay. I, I can say that there were very few Black publishers of sheet music. Um, one of them was W.C. Handy, uh, of course, the father of the blues. Um, and he worked with Harry Pace. Uh, if you listen to Radio Lab, uh, they actually have a really great podcast about Harry Pace called The Vanishing of Harry Pace um, and how he uh, kind of left the sheet music industry and founded the first, I think it was the first label to utilize all black talent um, called Black Swan Records. Um, but most of these publishers were white, if that's what the question is. Um, and then the second question was, is there a correlation between the the publishers and the producers. Is that the question, Jamie? Yes, that's the question. So I'm not quite sure um, what you mean. Uh, production, like a, a Broadway play or something like that. Um, then I think, yes, there was definitely a lot of, of working together that happened uh, from reading reports of especially the Tin Pan Alley, the physically located on Tin Pan Alley publishers, that they would have these sort of salons where a lot of the creative people of the day would come. Uh, you know, Irving Berlin might be there and a vaudeville star would come in and sing for, sing for him or sing for them. Uh, so there was definitely a lot of collaboration that was happening, both with uh, the publishers and performers, but also with the publishers and each other. Well, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a sort of comment slash question um, from Brian Sayer. He says he thinks that the next area of research would be about who is buying. In other words, think of moving the sheet music from the publisher to the seller to the final user. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely um, a, definitely a good way to go about it. Um, something I've kind of thought about as well, which I'm not quite sure if I could find, uh, would just be records from these publishers that illustrate their actual output each year rather than just going at it from, you know, how many songs do we have from Harms Inc. that ended up in collections. Um, I did some research into finding that information, but uh, it's been very difficult to come by. I actually reached out to Warner Brothers about Harms Incorporated and I unfortunately have not heard back from them. Well, hopefully you will soon. Yeah. Um, uh, besides piano and vocal transcriptions, what other instrumental ensembles were popular in sheet music? Sure. Uh, so we have a lot of um, we have a lot of jazz music. Um, most of what is in our collections uh, is for piano, just because that was the main instrument. Um, a lot of earlier music, you'll see uh, what's what are called obligatos for flute, um, just little extra parts that the, that a flutist could play along with. Um, something you'll also find quite a bit in our sheet music. Uh, just to kind of broaden the accessibility would be kind of um, if you've seen like chart markings for uh, string instruments. So you'll find kind of above each measure, you'll find a little uh, symbol for ukulele that shows where to place your fingers to play, a, you know, play ukulele along with the song. Um, or in some cases, you'll find just names of the chords along each measure. So these four measures, it'll say an A for A major, and then you'll see F7 for an F dominant seventh chord. Um, these publishers really wanted as many people as possible to be able to play their music, of course. So uh, especially from like 1900 to 1940 and onwards, you'll see a lot of symbols for string instruments like ukulele and guitar. Great. And we have a super helpful comment from an amazing and very engaged alum, David Yaffe. He said Warner Brothers is now two companies mm -hmm. and he suggests reaching out to Warner Music, which is separate from the movie TV production company. Thank oh, okay. you, David. Thank you. That's, that, that's a very good call. I, lo I love, love all the help. This is great. Um, uh, there's another uh, comment that actually came in through the chat. Did the actual printing of sheet music occur at the publishing house or were publishing houses sort of administrative only with outsourcing 
of printing and distribution elsewhere? Sure. Um, I think it, it varied uh, based on the size of the publisher from what I've seen. So um, some of these, like, I think if I look way up here, you'll see uh, this publisher was a music and musical instrument store that also happened to produce some sheet music on the side uh, versus a company like, you know, Harms Incorporated that was, you know, operating at a Rockefeller Center, they would have an administrative headquarters um, and then, you know, a separate space that was dedicated to the actual printing and publishing of the sheet music. This is all so fascinating and, I mean, just amazing work, really unbelievable what you've Thank done. You. Um, does anyone have any more questions? I know we are at the lunch hour. Oh. Was the music that accompanied early silent movies published as sheet music? Hmm. hmm. Uh, not to my knowledge. I know that a lot of the early music played for movies was actually improvised. Um, so in many cases, they might just be kind of looking up and, and playing along with the mood that they saw. But I haven't seen, just uh, off the top of my head, I haven't seen any music that was advertised as being used for silent films. Um, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if, if I searched for a couple of silent film titles, I think I would probably find uh, some sheet music that came from those, yeah. So for you personally, what's been the most surprising thing hmm. that you've experienced through this? That is a great question. Um, the biggest surprise has just been the genre in general, um, you know, my background is in classical performance. So uh, a lot of my training has been, you know, the Beethoven and the Brahms and the Mozart uh, and kind of in interpreting those things. So it's been really fun for me to kind of pivot to the popular music world um, where, you know, there's just so much of our country's cultural history, you know, like this map, it, it, it can't show it, but like, you know, the, the great American songbook is represented on this map. Um, so it's just been so much fun to get to know this music, uh, listen to so much of it. I'm spending all of my free time watching, you know, movies from the 30s and 40s and 50s. And uh, I think that's been both the biggest uh, challenge, but also what's been the most fun about this project. That's great. That's, I mean, that's awesome. What, um, like, if you had a wish list, what, mm -hmm. what's on your wish list um, to help you with your research and what you're doing? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, the biggest thing on my list would be the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, I would think. Um, you know, this project was, you know, partly uh, a, a result of that in, in that, you know, I didn't have access to physical spaces. Uh, a big passion of mine, as kind of Jim mentioned, is I run in the stacks. You know, I'm really passionate about public programming and performance and, you know, bringing music to, uh, to new spaces. Um, so without having access to those spaces, it's been, you know, kind of finding ways to use the data in the collection, um, and do it all digitally. But something I'm really, really looking forward to is being able to, you know, present live music again, uh, and, and just work with the collection in that way. And are you still performing? Like, do you still play? No, not playing very much, although I, I did recently join the Hopkins Symphony Orchestra, which I think will be rehearsing in January. They've been doing uh, only strings for now, uh, just for COVID safety reasons, but I'm, I'm very much hoping that I'll be able to start playing with them soon. Well, thank you for joining them. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Jed Galen is amazing and yeah, in yeah, he's very really good fantastic. hands. Um, we, we do have another question. Were any mm -hmm. of the publishing facilities um, purpose-built? or were they converted from other company uses? Um, a lot of what I've seen uh, just in kind of looking through, uh, especially the Whitmark autobiography that I mentioned was that um, these were converted spaces. Uh, I haven't seen any reference to a, like a building that was specifically built for publishing, um, but it doesn't seem like, you know, these were large machines, but most of the publishing took place in these kind of brownstones in New York City. So um, it doesn't seem like a specially built space was needed for producing sheet music. You just needed a room that was, you know, large enough to, to house the machine. Um, something I found kind of interesting is there's actually a, a New York City historic designation for 28th Street. And I think if you go there, which... I haven't been able to go because of COVID, but there's a plaque somewhere that says, you know, you are standing where the Great American Songbook was written. Uh, 
and they had to really fight to preserve these spaces. And there's just people now that are, you know, these are apartments. Like someone is living where, you know, Irving Berlin put out all of his sheet music, and they probably don't know that that um, that's what their their building was used for. So uh, it would be great. I'd love to go visit and maybe see if I can convince someone to let me inside and, and see how these buildings are used now. That's a great idea. I mean, actually putting together a, a in-person tour of this would be. I know. Yeah, and going back to your earlier question, something that kind of popped into my head if I had like unlimited resources and money and data would be um, to kind of create this uh, kind of like uh, virtual reality Tin Pan Alley. Um, you know, if we were to able like, you know, find historic pictures of what the entire block looked like uh, and figure out which songs were composed when to allow someone to kind of walk and walk through Tin Pan Alley and like look around and see all of these different buildings and hear songs that, you know, if we know these 10 songs were all published in 1908 to have those playing simultaneously so people can hear all of the music that was happening there. Uh, that would be very fun, I think. I love that idea. I think you should make it happen. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So um, any, um, any favorite songs? Favorite era. songs? Yeah. Uh, so one that I really like that I kind of got stuck in my head was Come Josephine and My Flying Machine, um, which was actually, I think it was sung in Titanic uh, as Rose is like kind of floating. She's singing to herself and she sings, up she goes, up she goes. Um, there's also um, Some of These Days, which was a big Sophie Tucker song uh, that's kind of been used by jazz bands kind of a lot a lot moving forward um you know there's alexander's ragtime band from irving berlin i think take me out to the ball game was a song that was produced during this period um so i think yeah if you listen to a lot of the songs you might not know that you know them but um but i think most people have heard a lot of these songs before yeah that's fascinating well um this has been wonderful i appreciate your time and your talent and all the hard work you've put into this this is truly amazing i think it's safe to say for everyone involved that this has been just wonderful and so pleasant and um with that i will wrap it up and we will share a recording of this program with everyone who attended along with some resources and our event schedule calendar so if you're interested in attending more of these, please do. We, we love seeing you and uh, wish you a safe and healthy, happy holiday season. So thanks again for everything. My dog loved it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you everyone.